Today, I want to tell you a story. The last several weeks, we have been with Jesus in the beginning of his ministry, and he spent time in the desert preparing for public life, calling his first disciples, and beginning to tour the countryside, gaining larger and larger crowds. Today, we are much further along. Jesus was making waves, and he had caught the attention of the Pharisees and the other leaders. They had tried to have him arrested at a recent festival and snare him with other traps. He so enraged them at their last meeting that they spontaneously moved to try to stone him. Then at the top of the Gospel of John, chapter 9, hear the word of the Lord. As Jesus went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. After saying this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. This word means scent. So the man went and washed and came home seeing his neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, Isn't that the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed that he was. Others said, No, it only looks like him. But he himself insisted, I am the man. How are your eyes opened? they asked. He replied, This man they called Jesus made some mud and put it on my eyes. He told me to go to Siloam and wash, so I went, I washed, and then I could see. Where is this man, they asked. I don't know, he said. They brought the man to the Pharisees. Now the day on which Jesus had made the mud and opened the man's eyes was a Sabbath. Therefore the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. He put mud on my eyes, the man said, and I washed and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others asked, how can a sinner perform such signs? So they were divided. Then they turned again to the blind man. What have you to say about him? It was your eyes he opened. The man replied, he is a prophet. They still did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they sent for the man's parents. Is this your son, they asked? Is this the one you say was born blind? How is it that now he can see? We know that he is our son, his parents answered, and we know he was born blind. But how he can see now or who opened his eyes, we don't know. Ask him. He is of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders who had already decided that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. That is why his parents said, he is of age. Ask him. A second time, they summoned the man who had been blind. Give glory to God by telling the truth, they said. We know this man is a sinner. He replied, whether he is a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. Then they asked him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered, I have told you already and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to be his disciples too? 
Then they hurled insults at him and said, you are this fellow's disciple. We are disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses, but as for this fellow, we don't even know where he comes from. The man answered, now that is remarkable. You don't know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to the godly person who does his will. Nobody has ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. To this they replied, You were steeped in sin at birth. How dare you lecture us? And they threw him out. Jesus heard that he had been thrown out, and when he found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir? The man asked. Tell me so that I may believe in him. Jesus said, You have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking to you now. Then the man said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. Jesus said, For judgment I have come into this world so that the blind will see and those who see will become blind. Some Pharisees who were with him heard him say this and asked, What? Are we blind too? Jesus said, If you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin or separation from God. But now that you claim that you can see, your guilt remains. The word of life. Thanks be to God. In the midst of the coronavirus, we may all feel newly blinded right now. We feel the uncertainty, not knowing what will come next. It makes us feel helpless in the middle of the storm. We are grasping in the dark for information, for familiarity, and we may have trouble finding it. My unthinking presumption when I hear blindness is pitch black where you can see nothing. Like immediately after you turn off a light and your eyes haven't adjusted yet. However, when we think of the physical challenge of blindness, there are different types of or classifications depending on the severity of vision impairment. Today, only 15% of people considered blind have total blindness, where they can see no light at all. People who are considered legally blind can have a variety of conditions like macular degeneration, glaucoma, cataracts, or an injury that today might be able to be repaired with surgery. And we have people in all of these kinds of categories who may be watching this video. These people can see some things, but even with glasses, it may be very limited or to vague colors or shapes. In Jesus' day, many of us who wear glasses might be considered blind because we can't see without them. In today's narrative, the blind man probably had total impairment, no light at all. In comparison with us, in our figurative blindness, the man born blind may have had at least one advantage over us. He knew he was blind. This is how, always, how life has always been for him. Blindness is what was familiar. How long have we been blind without knowing it? Have we had one of the less severe conditions, but now we find ourselves totally in the dark? We come to the sudden realization of how blind we actually are, and perhaps how blind we have always been. When we find ourselves in this position, what do many people want to do? We may even find ourselves doing this, trying to fix blame, just like the disciples do, just like the Pharisees do in this passage. Whose sin, whose fault is this? 
Jesus tells us that this is the wrong question. In this passage, Jesus doesn't want to talk about the why. He talks about how the works of God might be displayed in the midst of suffering, yes. In the midst of tragedy, yes. In the center of chaos, yes. Look at this week's picture, which is above the video playlist on the webpage. Jesus gets right in there with the man, and he is changing this man's life right before our eyes, giving him new life, giving him abundant life. It looks like such a small thing. We don't hear about anything spectacular. In fact, in our current situation of trying to give, keep everything clean and sanitized, it can sound a bit disconcerting. Jesus mixes saliva with dirt to make mud to put on the man's eyes and tells him to go and wash it off. But the man listens to Jesus and does what he is told. When he opens his eyes, he can see. This is no small thing. Even now with modern medicine, sight often degenerates and cannot be restored. Just a couple of weeks ago, there was a story on the new and revolutionary technique being tried at the KCI Institute in Portland, where an inert, genetically modified virus is injected into the eye of a person blinded by a genetic disorder. The hope is that the genetic problem will be removed by this inert virus and the eye will then be able to repair itself. It is hoped that some vision will be able to be restored. The researchers are very hopeful, yet this is only in the test phase. There is the healing of the vision for this man, but then there is an aspect I had never considered before. There is the whole psychological side as well. The brain has to learn how to interpret all of this new information that it is receiving. A person who was born blind wouldn't have been able to acquire things like depth perception like most people do as they grow up. They might know how something feels, but they don't know how it looks. So even now, those who are able to have sight for the first time have to learn before they can be allowed to go home. This getting your sight thing is a lot more complicated than we might have thought. When Jesus heals the blind man, he not only fixes the physical problem in his vision, he gives the man the ability to interpret all the new visual data as well. Otherwise, the man would still be wandering in a state of confusion if he could walk at all. All of this makes Jesus a miracle even more remarkable than we may have realized. In this moment, Jesus comes and completely changes this man's life. It's not about determining who is to blame. It was an opportunity to save and to give abundant life. He receives much. He was a beggar who was ostracized from his people. He no longer has to suffer from isolation and marginalization. He is saved from continual darkness. He won't have to wonder where his next meal will be or who may be willing to even acknowledge him as he sits begging. He will know the safety and security of others in a way that he's never experienced before. And there is something else very important too. To. He is now a disciple. Jesus can come into our perhaps newly realized emotional and spiritual blindness as well. He can enter the storms of our lives like the storm we are experiencing right now. This week, I was reminded of the story of Jesus walking on the water during a storm in Matthew chapter 14. In this chapter, Jesus, in fact, was dealing with several storms. First was the storm of grief. 
that he had to deal with from the news of the death of his cousin, John the Baptist. Then there was the storm of providing for people confronted with food scarcity in the desert. After that, he sends his disciples off in the boat and he takes some time to self-isolate on a mountain and pray. Meanwhile, a weather storm had whipped up on the Sea of Galilee and Jesus comes to the boat to the disciples in the midst of the storm, walking on the water. He comes to us in the midst of our storms and he goes with us through the storm. He comes to us while we are blind, yet we can hear his voice before we can see him. Like the blind man, it's like Jesus says in the next chapter, explaining this extraordinary sign that he performed when he says, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. They too will listen to my voice. This is all because, as he says, I have come that they may have life and may have it to the full. When Jesus talks about this full life, this abundant life, he is not talking about riches. He is talking about a life that has a full relationship with God, one in which we rely and depend on Jesus to provide all of that for us. Jesus comes to us and he opens our eyes. He invites us to look to him. He is the light of the world, just like the man who is no longer blind. He invites us into relationship with him. In this way, we are reborn and we have new life. In this way, we can see the path forward. We have a daunting path in front of us. This is not the first time a plague or a pandemic has affected God's people. God has been in it with them and brought them through it. God will do it again. This is a time that calls for us to be the church. In Rod Stark's book, The Rise of Christianity, he talks about the response of the early church to two outbreaks, the plague of Galen from the years 165 to 180 AD and the plague of Cyprian in the year 250 to 262. Christian behavior during these times strengthened the church and how they were seen in their community. We can use Jesus's examples to be advocates, to demonstrate compassion and allegiance to each other and to our neighbors. This is the role of the church in this broken world. We are working on different ways that we, as Joseph United Methodist Church might do. One way is volunteering through the Community Action Network that I referred to earlier as they develop a list of people who can help those in need during this self-isolating time when people may need extra help. I sent out that email a couple of days ago with information about how to do that. Another way is just to call the people you know. As I mentioned, we have developed a phone tree for the people within our church, but call your neighbors. Even when we find ourselves unable to stop the hardship or to provide healing, we can continue to pray and to simply tell the truth about what we know. Like the man who is no longer blind in today's reading, that refused to back down in the face of great pressure from the leaders. We know that Jesus will be with us in it and through it all. The media, both social and traditional, have been full of stories and commentary about what the whole world is going through with, with this pandemic. There is self-distancing, self-isolation, sheltering in place and lockdown. It is daunting to say 
the least. In this fourth week of Lent, one of the things that I liked the best and that gave me the most hope was a post by Chet Pritchard. It summed up what I've been thinking through this time. And it says, what we are doing now is Lent, giving up everything so that our friends might live. Sounds pretty familiar to me. Remember, this is not the first pandemic to affect God's people. Remember that God is faithful. And it is okay to admit to ourselves and to our God that we feel helpless and we don't know what to do. Knowing that God is faithful and that God will display the works of God. We have to be on the lookout for the glimpses of God's good. And then share it. Call a friend, tell them about it. Text a neighbor, make a Facebook post about it. Tell everybody, this is what I saw or experienced today. Encourage one another. Then as we offer a smile or a wave at someone at least six feet away, we may be offering a sign of God's peace to them. And this can remind others that while we may be distant, we are not alone. Amen.